Hey folks, welcome back to another lecture video for Chem 104. In this lecture video, we are going to continue our tour of the periodic table of elements by discussing where we last left off on, which is in talking about groups and periods. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and start with periods first, and we'll go ahead and talk about groups in a little bit of a greater detail. So periods are marked by elements belonging to the same row. So for example, hydrogen and helium, since they're found on the same row, they will have the same period number, which is period one. Overall, there are seven periods in the periodic table of elements. And the first five periods are pretty straightforward to identify. So for example, um, once again, hydrogen and helium are the two elements that belong to period one. For period two, we have lithium beryllium, um, so lithium beryllium, and then boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. So all of these elements over here belong to period two. We can continue that train of thought for period three, so sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicone, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon are all elements that belong to period three. And so period four, it's going to start off with potassium, which is capital K, then calcium, then scandium. And so basically all of these elements over here belong to period four. All of these elements here belong to period five. Now, when you guys get to period six and period seven, it's a little bit tricky. So here we start off with cesium and then barium. And then right when you get to lathanum, which is marked by the uh, atomic number, number 57, um, notice how we go from lathanum to hafnium. We go from 57 to 72, where well, where are all of the numbers in between 57 and 72? So it turns out that all of these elements right here um, are supposed to be embedded between this space. So here we have lathanum, then we have cerium, so 57 to 58. So when we're identifying the elements that are in period six, we're gonna start with cesium, and then the moment we hit lathanum, our eye should go towards the lathanite series, which is marked by um, cerium first. So it's going to be lathanum, then cerium, then all of these elements here, all the way to lutetium, which is LU, number 71, um, are all supposed to be right in this, embedded right in this space. So it's kind of like Harry Potter. I'm not too sure if you guys are uh, big Harry Potter fans, but remember when they were when Harry Potter was trying to go through the the uh, the wall um, in the train station? Uh, I think it was nine and three quarters, if I remember my my um, Harry Potter correct. And I apologize if I don't. So you can imagine this is that that platform over there, that nine and three quarters, where you know all of a sudden it just takes you to another world. Um, and so the moment you get to hafnium number 72 uh, once again we're still we're going to be back to period six actually we, we never left so all of these elements that i'm kind of highlighting belong to period six and so the same idea goes with period seven here we have francium um, and so when we get to francium and then uh, ac which is going to be actinium number 89 Notice how there's a little shadow over here. And so that's going to tell us that our eye needs to go in this direction before we hit 104, which is rutherfordium. So from actinium, from 89, we're going to jump to 90, which is TH or thorium. And so this is going to be the actinite series because it's first marked by um, actinium. And so actinium, or I'm, I'm sorry, the actinite series fr starts from actinium then goes to thorium, and then continues all the way over here to LR, which is Lorentzium. Um, so all of these elements 
belong to period 7, where all of these elements belong to period 6. And so the moment you pass Lorentzian 103, then you go back to 104, which is uh, Rutherfordium. And then all of these elements, once again, belong to period 7. Um, once again, just to kind of show you the, the, the train of thought, we're going to start from Francium, period 7, hit uh, Actinium, and then this, these are all of the um, actinite series. And then once we pass um, Lorentzium, then we're going to go ahead and go to Rutherfordium, which is 104. And then all of these elements over here um, still belong to period 7. All right, so that's pretty much it about um, periods I wanted to cover. Uh, let's go ahead and start talking about the groups. And so groups are basically marked when um, you have elements in the same column in a periodic table. So for example, here, we're starting from the left-hand side of the periodic table. This is going to be group one. Um, and then the next column over, these are group two. So all of these elements belong to group one. All of these elements belong to group two. Um, all of these elements belong to group three. Now I want you guys to notice that there's two types of group threes. So there's group 3B and then there's group 3A. Okay. Um, and so basically, you know, groups can be uh, subdivided into two parts. One, it's called the main representative elements or their main group elements. They're both synonymous. They're talking about the same thing. And then the other one is going to be the transitional elements or transition elements. And so let's go ahead and talk about the main group elements or the representative elements first. Very similar to what we discussed in the previous lecture, the main group elements are marked with first their group number, so group number one. And then since they're representative or main group elements, they're going to be followed up with a letter, which is capital A, or lowercase a, it doesn't really matter. And so this is going to be group 1A. This is group 2A. This is group 3A. This is group 4A. Group 5A. Group 6A. Group 7A. And then finally, group 8A. Okay. So overall, there are eight groups that represents the main group elements or the representative elements. Now the transition elements are going to be uh, marked by uh, the number uh, of the group. So this is 3 followed by the letter B, whether it's capitalized or lowercase. So scandium um, and all of these elements over here, so yttrium, um, Lathanum and actinium, all four of these elements belong to group 3B. Here we have titanium, zirconium, hafnium, and rutherfordium. That's going to be group 4B. Okay, and then the list continues. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about uh, what's happening here um, or what's happening here. You guys can just say 7B, you know, 8B, 9B, 10B. 11b, 12b. So we don't have to go into super great details about the labeling of the groups for the transition elements. And so the transition elements are is basically this whole block that includes the lathanide and the actinide series. Um, so all of this stuff that I'm, I'm circling belong to, uh, or I'm sorry, are transition elements. And so these transition elements, they uh, don't really follow the pattern in terms of their chemical and their physical properties that the main group elements have or the representative elements have. And we'll see that when we talk about, for example, their ionic charges, their uh, atomic size, um, and the list continues. And so sometimes we kind of ignore the transition elements um, when we talk about some of these patterns, just because they kind of fluctuate as we go from left to right or light or right to left. Whereas the representative elements or main group elements are pretty consistent in their um, patterns for chemical and physical properties. 
Now, there is this thing called post, post transition elements. And so the post transition elements are elements that are like right here. Okay. And when we start talking about ionic charges, I'll go ahead and uh, cover post transition elements. But you know, the, the post transition elements, the only relevance to that with what you guys need to know for this course is um, that they have fluctuating ionic charges. They have, they don't have a fixed charge. They have multiple charge forms. And once again, we'll talk more heavily into that when we talk about ions in the next chapter. All right, so some more information about groups. Uh, some groups ha have very special names. And so for example, group 1A, they're also known as the alkali metals. And so I see this constantly every single semester. So I, I, I do want to point it out. Um, and I do point it out every single semester, but um, sometimes it you know slips students' minds and I totally understand. Hydrogen is not a metal. Hydrogen is a gas. However, it's underneath group 1A. And so some students think that hydrogen is an alkali metal. It is not an alkali metal. So your first alkali metal really starts with lithium. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, um, all of these elements are your alkali metals. Um, so it just so happens that hydrogen belongs to group 1A and um, the name of group 1A is alkali metals, but hydrogen is not an alkali metal. So please, please, please remember that. Um, so for group 2A, starting with beryllium, we have the alkaline earth metals. And so all of these elements, I'm going to go ahead and redo it. So beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and um, radium, they are all uh, alkaline earth metals. They belong to group 2A. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and skip the transition elements in terms of, you know, the special names of the groups. Uh, there's actually two more names that you guys need to be aware of. Um, and it's basically the last two columns in the periodic table, the halogens and the noble gases. And so the halogens is group 7A, which is going to be fluorine, chlorine, um, bromine, iodine, and astatine. So all of these elements over here, group 7A, um, uh, belong to the special family called halogens. Actually, halogens are specifically only fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Okay, and so very similar to like to al to to hydrogen with respect to alkali metals, um, acetine. Even though it's under group 7A, it's not part of the halogens. And so your so these four are your halogens. Your noble gases is group 8A. And so all of these elements, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and uh, radon, oops, um, th these are all of your noble gases. Okay. Now, for the main group elements, the, these, this section over here, they don't have very fancy names like halogens, noble gases, alkaline earth metals, and alkaline metals. Um, so sometimes we can use the uh, name of the element at the very top to describe this whole family. So for example, we can sometimes say group 3A or the boron family. And so when somebody says boron family, you're talking about all of these elements. We can say group 4A or carbon family, which are all of these elements. And so group 5A, and we can, or we can say the nitrogen family. Uh, for group 6A, we can say, um, instead of saying group 6A, we can say the oxygen family. OK. 
Okay, so from group 3A to 6A, we can go ahead and use the first element at the very top of that column and refer to this whole entire thing um, as a family of that first element. So that once again, boron family, carbon family, nitrogen family, oxygen family. All right, um, and so those are um, pretty much the you know the special names, if you will, of of these main group or representative elements. And so the next thing I want to discuss is um, the placement of of metals, oops, metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. And we'll go through what characteristics um, metals have versus metalloids versus nonmetals, but notice that they're kind of color-coded and so anything that is uh, blue are going to be considered the metals anything that's considered green are known as the metalloids and anything that's yellow rep uh, basically represents the non-metals and so looking at the periodic table of elements I, I do want you guys to note that there's a lot of blue that we see um, so all of these elements are going to be considered metals. They have properties of what it means to be a metal. The metalloids really lie on this staircase that's kind of bolded in black. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in for now. And so here uh, the staircase always starts at the bottom left, or um, not the bottom, the top left corner of uh, boron. Okay. So from the top left corner, we're going to draw a line down, and then we're just going to make a staircase. And so the idea is that um, any element with an exception of one that touches the staircase is going to be considered a metalloid. And so basically anything in green here are metalloids. So I want you guys to notice that boron touches the border to that that um, it touches the the staircase silicone and germanium they both touch the staircase arsenic and uh, stibium or an antimony uh, they both touch the staircase tellurium polonium they both touch the staircase as well as astatine now there's only one exception to this rule and that is aluminum and you guys have touched aluminum before. Um, and so if you guys go to the grocery store and get aluminum foil, that's pretty much um, as pure of aluminum as you guys can get. And so aluminum is considered a metal. Okay. And so it is not a metalloid, even though aluminum technically touches this black line that's part of the staircase. Now, um, to the right of the staircase, if you will, it's basically all of these elements that are in yellow. So all of these elements that are in yellow are known as non-metals. Now there is one other non-metal that, that's not technically to the right of the staircase, it's to the left of this you know, staircase over here, which is gonna be hydrogen. And so notice that the color of hydrogen is yellow, which is non-metal. And so we, we have some trends, we have some exceptions. Uh, you know, not everything is going to fit into a beautiful, you know, pattern or something like that, even though we want it to. Okay, so once again, um, the staircase is going to be our reference point when we want to describe where the metals and nonmetals are. So the nonmetals are to the right of the staircase. The um, metals are to the left of the staircase. So basically all, all of these elements are over here are, the, are found left with respect to the staircase and therefore they're considered metals. And so basically elements that fall along the staircase with the exception of aluminum are going to be our metalloids. Um, also hydrogen is an exception. Um, hydrogen belongs to the nonmetals. All right, 
And so this is just um, another perspective with respect to the locations of metals, non-metals, and metalloids. It's basically the same thing that we covered that I just covered over here. Um, so characteristics of metals, um, there. So if you if you want to put in some physical properties that describe metals, they're basically shiny and they're ductile, and they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Nonmetals, on the other hand, they tend to be dull, um, brittle, and poor conductors. So it looks like um, they're more or less polar opposites of each other, right? So metals are shiny and ductile. Uh, Nonmetals are dull, they're brittle, and they're poor conductors of electricity. Metalloids are kind of like a hybrid between the metals and the nonmetals. So they have properties of uh, what they have properties that's similar to metals. They have um, at the same time they have properties that's similar to nonmetals. Okay. So for example, silicone is an example of a metalloid. Uh, and so this is a slide that just kind of describes um, the physical properties of silver and antimony, which is uh, abbreviated as SB. So SB is coming from the Latin name stibium. So stibium is a Latin name for antimony or antimony. Um, uh, AG, the letters for the chemical symbol of silver, they're coming, it's coming from the Latin name. AG is argentum. And so argentum is the Latin name of silver. And so notice that S is S, so sulfur, sulfur. Sulfur doesn't really have a Latin name. Uh, but long story short, um, this, these just describes the physical properties of these uh, representative elements that represents either a metal, metalloid, or a non-metal. Okay. And so this is basically what they look like. Um, so here we can see that silver, it's a hard metal, it's very shiny. Um, and antimony, uh, it's somewhat shiny, but somewhat uh, like um, a ductile. Uh, so here, sulfur, um, if you guys have ever gone to like Yellowstone or something like that, and you guys, or if you guys have seen like a sulfur lake, uh, it's, it's bright yellow. Um, it kind of looks like a, a regular rock that you can kind of break by stepping on it or by slamming a hammer on it. Um, there's one other thing that I do want to mention, and that's the location of the diatomic gases. And so this periodic table just kind of highlights where elements naturally exist as a diatomic molecule. And so what does it mean to be diatomic? Well, it means that you have two of that atom, or you have two atoms for that element. And so for example, here we have hydrogen. So hydrogen does not exist in its singular form. And so it turns out that hydrogen um, naturally exist as a uh, diatomic com um, diatomic compound or a diatomic molecule, and so um, so here we have H two. Uh, so basically, for hydrogen, we have two atoms of hydrogen that are connected by a covalent bond, and so this basically represents a diatomic gas. And so there are overall, um, I want to say seven, am I right? Let me count that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven elements that are naturally diatomic. And so that is hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, one way that you guys can memorize it is by looking at the positions in the periodic table. So here we have that lonely hydrogen, and then the, the six elements are kind of shaped into an L. So we have like NOF, and then all of the halogens. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Um, so if you guys don't have the periodic table of elements in front of you, there's another way to identify your diatomic gases, and I think I've already um, said it before, and that's going to be Hofbrinkel. Oops. Okay. 
Um, now there is, there is another way for you guys to to memorize this. Um, some people like using the sentence "Have no fear of ice cold beer" or something like that, and they they just take the the first one or two letters of each of those words, and that'll represent the elements. But you know, um, I kind of just like this name. I just feel like it's a little bit more unique. Um, Hofbrinkel. And so if you guys can memorize Hofbrinkel, then you've memorized all of your diatomic gases. So hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. And so what this really tries to, to, to represent is H2O2, F2, Br2, I2, N2, Cl2. Okay, so these are the elements that are naturally diatomic. Now, as we go towards, you know, bromine and iodine, um, even though we identify them as diatomic gases, at very specific temperatures, bromine and iodine can um, much more easily uh, become solid and liquid in state um, at room temperatures. And so we'll, we'll, maybe we'll talk about the physical properties of iodine and bromine um, at different temperatures but just know that they, they can um, either be liquid at room temperature or solid at room temperature uh, compared to all of the other uh, diatomic gases. And that's due to their, you know, um, their, their properties. So for example, their atomic size, it has an influence on uh, the intermolecular force and that the, depending on the strength of that intermolecular force, it can uh, describe or reflect the physical state of matter that they're in at room temp. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play like a quick little game that's known as the periodic scavenger hunt. And so the periodic table scavenger hunt just helps us uh, utilize the terminologies that we kind of gone over. Um, and uh, basically it's gonna help us kind of exercise those, those terminologies and identify the elements based on what it's describing. And so um, let's go ahead and look at the first example. So what element is found in group 4A in period 5? And so what I'm going to be using, I'm going to X out of this um, PowerPoint real quick, and I'm going to show you guys the periodic table that I've posted in your um, syllabus, or I'm sorry, um, it's in your canvas under syllabus and resources. And so um, this is the periodic table that you guys are going to have. This is what you guys should be using. Um, so this periodic table identifies, uh, for example, the atomic number. And we'll talk about the atomic number and all the details in, in a second. But I do want you guys to notice that hydrogen is represented twice. That's not a typo. Uh, so remember how I told you that hydrogen is a nonmetal. So this is just another way to um, organize hydrogen as a nonmetal. Instead of bringing it, uh, instead of it being under group 1A, it's right above fluorine. But that doesn't mean that hydrogen is a group 7A element. It's hydrogen is a group 1A element. But this is just describing that hydrogen is a nonmetal, not a metal. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of erase that for now. So um, that way we don't get confused. Okay. So you guys can go ahead and do so. Uh, do the same thing in your own um, periodic table. And so this is what the periodic table of elements look like with all of the details that I want um, to be included. And so I totally forgot what the question was. Let me go back. So what we're going to do is identify the element that's found in group 4A in period 5. Okay. So we want um, period 5. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then group 4A. Well, this is 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A. And so we're going to go ahead and go across, and then we're going to go downward. Um, so it looks like the element that 
I'm trying to describe or trying to identify is um, SN or TIN. Okay. And so I'm going to go back to my lecture over here. And so SN is TIN. And where is the S coming from? So if ever you guys see abbreviations, letters in the abbreviation that you cannot find in the name of the element, then that probably means that there is a Latin name um, for that specific element. And so SN is stanum. So stanum is the Latin name of tin. Okay, just a little background there. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next example. What metalloid or metalloids are found in period six? And so I'm going to go back and uh, I'm going to identify where period six is, which is over here. And I need to identify the metalloids. So remember the metalloids uh, are identified, or I can start identifying the metalloids by drawing a staircase. And the staircase starts from the top left corner of boron and then it kind of goes down. And so let me th uh, thicken up my line real quick. And so I'm gonna have this, okay. And then I'm just gonna highlight all of my metalloids. So remember it's the elements that are touching that staircase with the exception of aluminum. So that's boron, silicone, germanium, um, arsenic, um, stibium, I always call it stibium, it's antimony, um, tellurium, polonium, acetine. All right, so what we wanna do is identify the metalloid or the metalloids that's in period six. Well, here if I go across, it looks like I have two metalloids, which is polonium, PO, and acetine, AT. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just put in that symbol, um, PO or polonium. And then we have um, acetine. And acetine, uh, I believe, is AT. Oops. Okay. All right, so for the next example, we're going to go ahead and uh, figure out the diatomic gas that's found in period three. And so um, period three is what we're looking for, as well as the diatomic gas. So here's period three. So uh, instead of circling, I'm just going to draw a line or an arrow through it. So all of these elements represents period three. And so of all of these elements in period three, which element is a diatomic gas? So I'm going to go ahead and mark in orange all of the diatomic gases. So remember, the diatomic gases are Hofbrinkel. So here I have hydrogen. Um, uh, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, um, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. Okay, And so in period three, it looks like my only uh, diatomic gas is chlorine. And so I'm just going to go ahead and put in Cl oops, over here. And I'm going to go ahead and put in chlorine. All right, so let's go ahead and do the next problem. Hopefully you guys are kind of understanding how all of, uh, the, how all of these um, questions are, are phrased and what you're supposed to do to identify the, the elements. Um, so what alkaline earth metal is found in period four? Actually, there is one thing I forgot. I, I, um, I knew I forgot something. Let's go ahead and talk really quickly between um, alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals and so I'm not going to talk about like the physical properties the differences between the two um, I just want to talk about how to memorize them and so I want you guys to notice that both of these special names have the word metals and so I'm just going to go er I'm just going to erase metals right so I have alkali and alkaline earth and so sometimes students have a hard time remembering which is which 
Um, if you look at the, the number of words in its name, if we take out metals, notice that alkali has only one word, so therefore it's group one. Alkaline earth has two words, and so therefore it's group two. Okay, so once again, that's a little t uh, tip, a little trick that helps you guys identify alkali metals from alkaline earth metals. All right. So what alkaline earth metal is found in period four? I'm going to go ahead and go back to the periodic table. Here's period four, and we're going to go, we're going to look at alkaline earth metals. So this is alkali metals. This is alkaline earth. And so basically it's calcium. Okay. So here I have, um, so here I have two words. So I know that's uh, group group two. Specifically group two A. And so in period four, that's gonna be calcium. Okay. So what non-metal are is found in group five A. Okay. So remember groups are columns, so this is group 4A, this is group 5A. And what the question is asking, I totally forgot actually, it is what non-metal is found in group 5A. And so remember that non-metals are to the right of the metalloids. And so if these are all of the metalloids, with the exception of aluminum, then anything, then all of these elements over here are our non-metals. And so since we're looking at specifically 5A, there's actually two choices. There's nitrogen and there's phosphorus. Okay. So it looks like we do have a couple of elements that are non-metals in group 5A, which is going to be nitrogen, and phosphorus. Okay. All right, so looking at the last question, we're gonna describe where mercury is found in the periodic table. And so the chemical symbol for mercury is Hg. Um, if you recall from the previous lecture, the Latin name for mercury is hydrargyrum. And so um, mercury, is found right here. And so if we had to describe the position of mercury, um, we actually can say uh, several things. One, mercury is found in the transition elements. And so, you know, when, when you use that word, you're telling the reader to look around this area, right? Um, actually, this area. And so if I want to be more specific, I can say that mercury is found in period six. And then group, uh, so this is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. So I can say uh, group 12B and period six. Okay. So that's where mercury is can be found. So it's group 12B. Remember the B represents the transition metals, um, not the main group elements or the representative elements. And period six. Okay. So that's a fun little exercise just to kind of um, tie in uh, you know, the, the chemical symbols and the names of these elements to its position in the periodic table of elements. Okay. And so um, it looks like there's about 20, there's, I think there's 24 elements that are essential for the well-being and survival of, of the human body. And so only four of those elements make up 96% of our body mass. They are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen fun fact, right? 
And so we have all of these other um, elements that are considered either macro minerals or micro minerals. So the macro minerals are calcium, phosphorus, potassium, chlorine, sulfur, sodium, and magnesium. And so if you guys are taking anatomy and physiology, you'll see where all of these macro, these elements kind of play in terms of, for example, uh, the sending of a nerve signal or the regulation of cellular metabolism or uh, the mu muscle contraction. That's a big one for anatomy phys. And so we're talking about the depolarization of, for example, um, uh, of a nerve cell. Uh, actually, the, the difference in um, uh, chemiosmotic potential. Um, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and leave all of that fun details in, in anatomy phys, but basically, you know, it's utilizing uh, sodium, chlorine, potassium, whereas muscle contraction involves calcium, uh, as well as uh, changes in concentration in, in like potassium, chlorine, and sodium, and all that stuff, and magnesium. Um, and so uh, I can definitely go into greater details about these macro minerals, their functions, and you guys don't really need to know that. Um, just th this is just a FYI for your own information that these macro minerals are involved in um, these processes. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, the periodic table a little bit much closer in greater detail. Um, and so when you guys are using or when you guys are looking at the periodic table, there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of letters uh, that can be found. And we need to start um, becoming familiar uh, how to use the information that it contains to determine, for example, the number of protons, the number of neutrons, the number of electrons. And so um, an atom of any element is comprised of three main subatomic particles. And so the first subatomic particle is going to be the proton, uh, which are positive in charge. So proton positive. Um, and so the the next subatomic particle is going to be the neutron. And so notice that in this diagram of an atom, and we'll talk about the electronic structure of an atom um, probably uh, on Wednesday, but I want you guys to notice that both protons and neutrons, these subatomic particles, are kind of densely packed in the center. And so this is known as the nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus are um, smaller, much, much smaller subatomic particles known as electrons because they are negative in charge. And so these subatomic particles, we can't really see them at all um, with our naked eye. However, based on the you know, evidence that a lot of scientists have gathered, um, we can determine the, their relative um, numbers by looking at the values that's provided in the periodic table. And so from the periodic table, we should be able to determine the number of electrons, the number of protons, the number of neutrons that are present for that specific element. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and, and take a look at uh, what each um, square, if you will, uh, in the periodic table tells us or what information it presents. So the periodic table that I want you guys to use, which is this guy right here, uh, I want you guys to just take a look at one. So for example, vanadium. So notice how there is a number at the top, then a letter, and then another set of numbers. And so um, the top number that you guys see in the periodic table it's known as the atomic number. So let me actually shorten this. And so this is known as the atomic number. And typically the symbol for the atomic number 
uh, the, the letter that we kind of use it, and you will see it again in isotopes, is letter Z. Um, and so the next piece of information, uh, it's, it's right below the atomic number, and that's going to be the chemical symbol. Let me make this arrow a little better. Okay. Um, and so this last number down here, that's going to tell us the atomic mass. And the atomic mass uh, can be represented by a letter A. And once again, we'll see that when we talk about isotopes. And so this is pretty much like you guys can look anywhere on the periodic table as you guys can see on the screen and the pattern kind of repeats itself so we have the atomic number at the top then we have the chemical symbol and then we have the atomic mass All right so basically everything here is what i've just kind of discussed the only thing that you guys will not be provided is the name of the element. And so I did not give you guys a, a periodic table that describes the name of the element. So once again, it's in your best interest to you know, go through the list of elements and start familiarizing yourself, right? You don't have to necessarily like memorize. I honestly would like you guys to memorize it, but in this learning distance uh, you know, setup, um, it's really hard for me to enforce that. But it will benefit you guys in the long run if you guys are in the sciences to be very familiar with the the main group elements at least, uh, and some of the um, transition elements such as like iron, cobalt, uh, uh, copper, gold, silver, etc. Okay. So once again, the atomic number um, has can be. Uh, abbreviated or represented as the letter Z and the atomic mass um, is going to be abbreviated it can be abbreviated by the letter A uh, and so one way to memorize this is that mass so notice how atomic is is both present in their names so very similar to the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals we can just go ahead and kind of like ignore it for now right and so there is an A in mass. And so this is the reason why, well, it's not the reason, but this is just my trick of helping you guys remember that the atomic mass is, uh, or can be represented by the letter A. And so, you know, there, there's no Z in number, um, but I guess if you guys wanna be fancy with it, you guys can put in like numbers, right? Um, quote unquote, just to help you guys remember that letter Z represents atomic number and um, capital A represents atomic mass. All right, so I need to move forward. Um, I think you guys are super smart. So once again, there are three subatomic particles in an element or in an atom. It's electron, proton, and neutron, right? So right in the center is nucleus. The nucleus is composed of the proton and neutron, and um, the electrons are the subatomic particles that kind of surround the nucleus. They surround the proton and neutron. So it turns out that um, the number of, of protons in any given atom of any given element is equal to its atomic number. And so in an electrically neutral um, element, we're going to assume that the number of electrons equals to the number of protons. And finally, the number of neutrons can be calculated by taking the difference between the um, mass number, uh, so atomic mass, so this is going to be A minus Z, so Z is the atomic number. Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and use these three uh, formulas, if you will, to calculate the number of protons, the number of electrons, and the number of neutrons. 
in a given element. And we're going to go ahead and work through a few examples here just to kind of get the hang of these, uh, get, trying to get the hang of this. And so um, let's go ahead and uh, do nickel. And so I'm going to have to actually write a little, uh, write nickel down. Um, so give me a second here. So nickel has an atomic number of 28. And so 58.6934. Sorry, I'm just writing it on a little scratch piece of paper on the side um, that's right next to me. And so let's just say that we're trying to determine uh, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons for nickel. And so the information that's provided to me in the periodic table looks something like this. So 20 at the top, then Ni for nickel, and then at the very bottom I have 58.6934. And so remember that the top number represents the atomic number. And so since the top number represents the atomic number, and uh, so the atomic number equals to the number of protons. So it turns out that nickel has uh, 28 protons. And I tend to abbreviate protons as P with a positive charge, right? So P for protons, and protons are positive and charged, that's why I put in a plus. And so in an electrically neutral element, the number of protons equal to the number of electrons. And so it turns out that if I have 28 protons for nickel, then we have on average 28 electrons, or E negative. And so if I were to calculate the number of neutrons, it's simply going to be the atomic mass minus the atomic number. Um, and so sometimes students kind of dig too deep into this to the point where they get the answer wrong because they kind of flip the numbers or whatever. And so um, it's basically the bigger number minus the smaller number. So if you guys are looking at this information from the periodic table of elements, the bigger number is always going to be at the bottom. So it's going to be the bigger number minus the smaller number. And since we can't really have a decimal for neutrons because it's um, you know, a defined object, we're just going to go ahead and round to the nearest whole number. And so the atomic mass is 58.6934, but with respect to um, calculating the number of neutrons, then we're just going to go ahead and round this up to 59 just to make our numbers simple. And so we're going to go ahead and take 59, the bigger number, minus the smaller number. And so here in this case, I have, um, do, 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 excuse me, so 59 minus 28, so I have 1. And then here 5 minus 2 is 3, so I have 31. So it turns out that nickel has, on average, 31 neutrons. And I... Uh, basically write neutrons with a symbol of N and then like a zero, meaning that um, there is no charge on a neutron. It's electrically neutral. It's not positive nor is it negative. And so if you guys wanted to create like, for example, um, a, a visual of what nickel looks like, um, in the nucleus, it has 28 protons and 31 neutrons. So you guys can kind of imagine that you have 28 of the blue stuff and then 31 of the orange stuff. And then you have 28 of the green stuff, which is 28 um, electrons. So all of these green stuff, that represents electrons. Okay. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to go ahead and go through one more example um, and then we're going to look at a table and a chart. And so um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and pick something from, for example, the nonmetals. So let's go ahead and do, uh, let's go crazy and let's do xenon. So 54 is my atomic number, the top number that I'm looking at. 
and then uh, the atomic mass is 131.293. All right. Sorry, I just have to write that on the side because I can't remember these numbers on the top of my head. I'm getting too old. So um, for xenon, I have an atomic number of 54 and an atomic mass of 131.293. And then we're going to still go through the same exercise. We're going to calculate the number of protons, we're going to calculate the number of electrons, and we're going to calculate the number of neutrons. And so since my atomic number is 54, well, that equals to the number of protons. And so here I have 54. Uh, here I have, since I have an elect, if we are assuming an electrically neutral element, then the number of protons equals to the number of electrons. And so basically, if you have 54 positive items, you need to have 54 negative items to balance it out to zero. So that's what it means to be electrically neutral. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in 54. And so for the number of neutrons, it's pretty straightforward. It's just the bigger number minus the smaller number. And so it's going to be A minus Z, or... 131, and so I'm going to round this to 131 um, just to make sure it's a whole number, minus Z, which is 54. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and subtract these two. So I'm going to go ahead and borrow uh, 1 and then carry over, put a 2. And so 11 minus 4, that's simply going to be 7. Um, and so 2 minus 5, I can't do that, so that's going to turn into a 0. Now it's 12 minus 5, and that's going to be 7. And so it looks like I have 77 neutrons, um, 54 protons, and 54 electrons for xenon. Okay. All right, so hopefully you guys, through go, going through these two examples, understand you know, what's happening. Um, and so what we're going to do, I'm not going to fill in all of this chart. I believe it's already filled in in your, uh, your annotated lecture notes. Um, but I, I do want to go over a few of these. And so it, if you guys have a chart like this where um, you're given certain pieces of information, you should be able to figure out the rest of that information just based on what's provided for you. And so since we haven't talked about isotopes just yet, I want to go ahead and just ignore this, this column over here. So we're going to go ahead and ignore that. Don't worry about this guy for now. Uh, that's in the next section. All right, so let's go ahead and work through the first example. So here we have aluminum. And so we, um, since we know the identity of our element, we need to figure out the number of protons, number of electrons, um, neutrons, atomic number, and mass number. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back to my periodic table, and I'm going to search for aluminum. And I know that the chemical symbol of aluminum is Al. Okay. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and write this on my little post-it note. Um, just so I don't have to go back and forth between these two screens. So I have 13 and 26.9815386, okay? And so um, for aluminum, since I have uh, an atomic number, oops. So since I have an atomic number of 13 and I have an atomic mass of 26.9815386. Okay, I'm just squeezing it all in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just fill in this chart. So my atomic number is 13 because that's what uh, the, the top number was. The mass number is going to be 26.9815386. Nine eight one five three eight six, 
And so sometimes you guys will um, see the mass number be rounded to the nearest whole number. And so we can go ahead and uh, take the mass number and just round it up to 27, and that's fine for now. When we start performing um, stoichiometry and calculations, we need to consider the decimals. But for now, we're, we're just going to go ahead and round it to the nearest whole number. And so based on this information, we need to fill in the rest. The number of protons here is equal to the atomic number. And so that's 13. Um, since we have 13 protons in an electrically neutral compound, we have 13 electrons. And then the, the number of neutrons is simply going to be the difference between these two. And so here we have 27 minus 13, the bigger number minus the smaller number. And so 27 minus 13, this is going to be 4, and we're going to carry down the 1, so the number of neutrons is 14. Okay. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, so what if you were given, for example, just the number of protons but nothing else? How can we identify, uh, how can we identify what the element is and all of that stuff? And so if you guys recall, the number of protons is the same as the atomic number, or Z. Okay. And so if I have five protons, then all I'm going to do is look at my periodic table and look, at, look where number five is. And so it turns out that five represents uh, boron. And it has a mass number of 10.811, or if we round it to the nearest whole number, it'll be 11. Okay. And so it turns out that the identity of the element is boron. Um, and if I have five protons and I have five electrons, and if you guys recall, the mass number was 11, and uh, the number of protons is always equal to the atomic number. So these two will always be the same. Okay. Um, when we talk about fluctuations in number of subatomic particles, the number of electrons and neutrons might change. Um, and that will give you ions and isotopes. And so we'll talk about that when we cross that bridge. But for now, we're just assuming everything is is regular, everything is fine, uh, everything's pretty normal. Um, and so for the number of protons, if we have five protons, then that means the atomic number is five. And so all we have to do is take the difference between these two, 11 minus five, and that's going to give us six. Okay. Oops. All right. So um, let's go ahead and, and just do one more here. Um, let's go ahead and look at these two. Okay. Um, now here for this column, it had it has given us the number of electrons and the number of neutrons, and so from this piece of information, we should be able to fit, fill in the rest. And so in an electrically neutral compound, or I'm oh, sorry, not in compound, electrically neutral element, the number of protons equals the number of electrons. So if I have 17 here, I have 17 here. And remember the number of protons equals to the atomic number. And so therefore it's going to be 17 here as well. Now without looking at the periodic table of elements, because this gave us this specifically the number of neutrons, the mass number is going to be the sum of protons and neutrons. Okay, So we can kind of do this mathematically. So remember that the, um, the mass number is going to be the protons plus neutrons. So typically, when we're trying to solve for neutrons, much like what we did in aluminum and boron, uh, we took the difference of these two, right? And so if I solve for n, I'm going to take 
protons and move it to the other side. And so the number of neutrons is equal to the mass number minus protons. Okay. But if we're looking, so this is really, you know, looking at it backwards. But if we really look at it in a forwards direction, the mass number is simply the sum of protons and neutrons. And so uh, we'll learn very soon that the um, mass of the atom is really centered around the nucleus. Remember that the nucleus is the sum of protons and neutrons. And so the sum of these two will give us the mass of the whole entire element, which is telling you that the mass of the electrons is pretty, pretty, pretty small compared to protons and neutrons. And so since the mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons, all we have to do is add 17 and 20, and then that's going to give us 37, okay, without uh, looking at the periodic table. And so to identify the identity of this element over here, we need to look at either the number of protons or the atomic number. And so we're looking for 17. And so if you look at 17, the identity of that element is chlorine, Cl. Now, if you look at the mass number at the bottom, it's 35. But if you look at what we put over here, it's 37. And so students might say, oh, well, you know, it says 35 in the periodic table, so I'm going to go ahead and put in 35 here. Now, that's not completely untrue. The reason why it's not correct in this example is because the number of neutrons is already specifically given. And so if the number of neutrons is specifically given, you have to use this number. You can't just look at the periodic table and say, oh, it's 35 because it says 35. Um, and so for this example, the identity of the substance is chlorine, Cl but the mass number is 37, not 35, like I said in the periodic table. And um, basically, if you have differences in mass number because of differences in neutrons, uh, this is telling you that this chlorine is an isotope of uh, a chlorine that has a mass number of 35. And we'll talk about um, isotopes in just a second. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies um, how to, you know, figure out all of the stuff that's in the chart. Uh, once again, if you guys look at the annotated lecture notes on Canvas, I believe I already filled in all of the numbers. Um, so you guys have the answers to this. And you guys have a worksheet on this as well. Uh, so um, go ahead and try it out on your own. All right, so everything that we've kind of discussed thus far just assumes that we have um, no fluctuations in the number of protons, the number of neutrons, the number of electrons. And so it's kind of like this ideal world. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's not the case. Um, there are specific, you know, scenarios in which elements can actually lose number of ion or no, lose the number of electrons or gain or increase the number of electrons. And then there are scenarios in which the number of neutrons inside the nucleus is going to be different. Excuse me, but uh, they have the same number of protons. And so, um, basically, if you fluctuate the number of neutrons and the number of electrons, the terminology to classify that element also changes. And so um, basically if you change the number of neutrons, that is when you would call that substance an isotope. Okay, When you change the number of electrons, that's when you call that specific substance an ion, okay? So it's an ion of that same element. It's an isotope of that same element. And so what's missing here is protons, right? And so that's telling you that if you change the number of protons, then that means you change the element 
all together. And so we can see that readily in the periodic table. So remember that the atomic number represents the number of protons. So if you go from five to six, you know, five represents boron, six represents carbon. So if you change the number of protons, if you change the atomic number, then you change the identity of the element completely. However, if you guys change the number of neutrons and change the number of electrons, we're still talking about the same element. However, we're uh, referring to it in another terminology. Um, so for example, like an isotope is like a relative of that element, right? So think of isotopes and ions like how you would refer brothers and sisters or like aunts and uncles, right? It's still kind of within that same family, but there's, um, you know, differences between the two. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about isotopes first. So we're going to talk about ions in the next chapter. Um, we're going to focus on isotopes for now. So um, if you guys have fluctuations in the number of neutrons, we're going to refer to that element as an isotope. So really, what's an isotope? It's when two or more atoms belong to the same element. So since we're talking about the same element, it has the same number of protons. The only difference between those two atoms, those two or more atoms, is that they have different number of neutrons. And so really that's the definition of isotopes. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. And so we're going to go ahead and take a look at um, isotopes of magnesium. And so it turns out that um, there's uh, different like um, variations of magnesium. And so here we have magnesium 24, magnesium 25, magnesium 26. And we'll talk about the, the, these symbols in just a second. Um, but basically, if you look at the number of protons and if you look at the number of electrons, for all of these magnesiums, they're the same exact, they have the same exact number. The only difference really is the uh, number of neutrons. And so notice how it's 12, 13, and 14. And so because they have different number of neutrons, their mass number will also change. Okay. So like one affects the other. Okay. And so in um, atomic mass units in AMU, it's 23.99, 24.99, 25.98. However, we're just rounding the mass number um, up here. So if you round up, it's going to be 24. If you round up, it's 25. If you round up, it's 26. Now, um, these isotopes, these three isotopes of magnesium, have um, the, their abundance kind of changes. Uh, so, if, for example, if, if we're global travelers or scientists and we go around the world and collect all of the magnesiums, 78.70% um, of the magnesium that we do collect has 12 neutrons. 10 approximately 10.13% of all the magnesiums that we collect has 13 neutrons, and about 11.17% of all of the magnesiums that we collect has 14 neutrons. Um, once again, the, the main idea of isotopes is that we have a change in the number of neutrons um, that belong to the same element, and that will change their mass number. But everything else, number of protons and number of electrons, stays the same. Okay. Um, so overall, there are two notations that uh, there are two notations for isotopes. That's basically the linear form, and we have the nuclide notation, which is what you guys kind of saw up here. Okay. Um, and so, for example, if we have um, Mg twenty five. Okay. So this is the shortened version of the linear form um, for isotopes. So if you guys see Mg25, 
that's telling you that this 25 represents the atomic mass, not the number of neutrons. Okay. So we know that magnesium is, um, we know that magnesium has an atomic number of 12. Okay. And so if you take 25 minus 12, then you get the number of neutrons. So here we have 12 protons. That will never change because that, that's a characteristic of magnesium. So here if we have 25 minus 12, that's going to give us, uh, so 5 minus 2 is 3, 13. So we have 13 neutrons. Okay. And so for the linear form of, of the notation for the isotope, here we can either have Mg25, so once again, 25 represents the atomic mass, not the number of neutrons. Um, that was my main point of that whole spiel. And so another way to write the linear form is literally write out the name of the element. So we can put in like magnesium-25. So this is the linear form, the linear version, if you will, uh, for <clears throat> um, notating isotopes. There's another one called nucleide notation. And so the, I'm just gonna go ahead and go down here at the bottom. There's already an image for it. So the nucleide notation is very specific. Um, so here X is representing the chemical symbol for the element. And then uh, A once again represents the mass number or the atomic mass. And Z represents the number of protons, or the atomic number, which we already discussed. And so uh, the, the main idea be behind the nucleide notation is basically put the bigger number on top and put the smaller number at the bottom, which kind of contrasts how it's kind of set up in the periodic table of elements. So notice the bigger number is always at the bottom, then you put the smaller number at the top. So it just, it's just kind of flipped, right? And it's flipped to, to um, set up the math easy. So remember that the atomic, to get the number of neutrons, it's simply the atomic mass minus the atomic number or the number of protons. And so the atomic mass is always going to be greater than the atomic number. And so we want, we want to put the larger number at the top, and then we want to put the smaller number at the bottom. So that way we can simply subtract it and we get four. So this is telling us that this isotope of lithium has four neutrons. Okay. And so um, that kind of demystifies how the setup of the nucleide notation is. So it's not like this complex thing. Um, we're just trying to make uh, life a little bit easier for us by just simply putting the number, the bigger number at the top and the smaller number at the bottom. So we can simply subtract down to get the number of neutrons, to calculate the number of neutrons if we wanted to. All right, so the notation for isotopes of magnesium, I'm not going to write this, is actually on the table. So notice that this is the... Uh, this is the nucleide notation of magnesium. Notice that the bigger number is always written at the top and the smaller number is written at the bottom. So 12 is the atomic number of uh, magnesium. So if you guys look at the periodic table, and if you look at where magnesium is, so this, that, this is where the 12 is coming from. Okay. And so if you guys look, the atomic mass is 24. Um, and so that 24 really is just an average, if you will, amongst all of the isotopes of magnesium. So here, um, predominantly, we 78% or 78.7% so uh, is going to have an atomic mass of 24. Okay. Um, then 10.13% has an atomic mass of approximately 25. 11.17% has an atomic mass of 26. All right, cool. 
So now that we've kind of gone through that, um, we're going to go ahead and work through a few examples on this chart uh, just to give us some practice on how to write the nucleide notation and um, amongst other things. So let's go ahead and start. So here, the first example gives us the um, nucleide notation. And so notice that I see N, so the identity of this element is nitrogen. And um, without having to look at the periodic table, I can kind of decompose this symbol. Remember, the bottom represents the atomic number. So the atomic number is 7. And so since the atomic number is equal to the number of protons, then this is 7 as well. And so since no other information is given to us, we're going to assume that we have the same number of electrons, so that's 7 as well. Um, and so if we're looking at the mass number, the nucleide notation will tell us that. So this number at the top, 15, is going to be the mass number for this specific element. So that's going to be 15 over, over here. I'm just going to highlight it to kind of um, show where I'm pulling the numbers from, right? And so to determine the number of neutrons, I can go ahead and simply subtract down. So 15 minus 7, that's going to give me 8. And so I'm going to go ahead and put in 8 neutrons over here, and I am done with that column. Or I'm sorry, not the column, I'm done with that row. So it's pretty straightforward. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the next example. So in the next example, the only piece of information that this thing gave us is the atomic number and the mass number. And so um, remember that the uh, nucleide notation is going to be the element, whatever this element is, and then we're going to put the mass number on top, the bigger number on top, and then the smaller number at the bottom. And so if we subtract these two, that's going to give us 10, which tells us the number of neutrons. And so here I can already fill in the number 10. Um, and so I know that the atomic number is the same as the number of protons. And so this is going to be 8. And since no other information is given, I'm going to assume that the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons. And so I've filled in um, all of this stuff so far. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to figure out the identity of this element by looking at the periodic table and uh, seeing what element represents the atomic number 8. And so I'm going to kind of scroll through, and lo and behold, 8 represents oxygen. And so I'm going to go ahead and put in oxygen here. And then for my chemical notation, instead of saying X, I'm going to put in this chemical symbol for oxygen, which is O. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in 18 at the top and then 8 at the bottom. Okay, so that's the nucleide notation for, the, for, this specific, for this specific isotope of oxygen. And so how do I know that this is an isotope of oxygen? Well, let's look at the um, mass number, which is 18. If you look at the periodic table, notice that the mass number is not 18, it's 16. And so if that mass number changes between the periodic table and what's given to you, then you know that it's referring to an isotope of that element. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and look at one more example. Um, so we're going to go ahead and look at the, the next one over here. So here we see 16 and 14. Okay. And so if we have um, 14 electrons, remember that the number of protons equals the number of electrons. And so I should have 14 here as well. And if my number of protons is 14, well, 
my atomic number is 14. And to get the mass number, it's simply the sum of, so if you recall the mass number, is the sum of protons and neutrons. So it's going to be 16 and 14, which is going to be 30. Um, and so once I have all of that figured out, I need to identify the identity of this element. Um, and I can do so by looking at the atomic number. So number 14 is going to be silicon or SI. So notice that the mass number is 28 on the periodic table. So that 28 is not the same as um, the mass number here, which is 30. So that's telling us that we're working with an isotope of silicone. Okay. So this is going to be silicone. And silicone is going to be SI. And then we're going to go ahead and put in the bigger number. So 30 at the top, and then the atomic number at the bottom, so it's going to be 14. Okay. So notice that the number of neutrons is 16 for this isotope of silicone. Um, and so if we go to the periodic table, if we take 28 minus 14, that gives us 14. So it looks like the number of neutrons for silicone is um, predominantly 14, but there are variations of silicone in which that specific atom of silicone has 16 neutrons, thereby giving it a different mass number. Okay. All right, so hopefully by going through these three examples, we have a better idea of how to calculate. Um, mass numbers, uh, atomic numbers, neutrons, electrons, and protons. Um, more importantly though, we're, it's the idea of, of identifying isotopes. Okay, And so once again, I know I sound like a broken record, I truly apologize, but if you have um, different numbers of neutrons, but you're still working with the same element, meaning same number of protons, then those two atoms are isotopes of each other. All right, so you guys can go ahead and look at the annotated lecture notes to figure the rest out. Um, I encourage you guys to try it on your own and then look at the annotated lecture notes that's, that I posted on Canvas to see if you guys are getting the numbers that I got there. Okay. So very quickly here, there's a lot of applications for isotopes in both um, industry and in medicine. So for example, an isotope of cobalt, cobalt-60, is used um, as a source of radiation therapy to prevent cancer. Iodine-131, so this is an isotope of iodine, um, enables us to locate brain tumors, monitor cardiac, liver, and thyroid activity, um, carbon-14. We can uh, you know, study the metabolism for patients with diabetes, gout, and anemia. And, you know, the list goes on. So there's a lot of medical applications to isotopes. And so this is um, a thyroid scintigraphy. Uh, so basically it's, it's taking a picture. So remember, so thyroid activity. So here we're using iodine-131. And what we're doing is we're uh, taking images using the radiation that this uh, isotope of iodine emits. Um, and so by, you know, comparing something that's normal to comparing what the uh, thyroid image looks like, um, we can identify if that specific individual has a specific disease or something like that, right? Um, so applications of, of isotopes in industry. Um, so for example, sodium-24, um, we can use it to perform um, oil well studies and locate leaks in the pipelines, um, uranium-235, nuclear power plants, uh, californium-252, we can use it to help us determine the moisture content of soil, um, and uh, americium-241, it'll help us uh, 
determine the overall thickness of rolling steel. Um, and so this is an example of uh, um, americium-241. So here we have the source of radiation. So this is where americium-241 is going to be located, and there's a detector. And so it's just going to pass um, you know, uh, beta particles through this uh, sheet of metal. And that will help us uh, you know, calculate the thickness of this metal sheet. And so um, the, one of the last things that I want to cover in this lecture video is the uh, mass number. So remember that the mass number or the atomic mass in a periodic table is found at the very bottom of the element. So all of these numbers with a decimal, all of those are the atomic mass. And so much like you guys have seen um, in when, when I was talking about isotopes, uh, this these atomic masses represent like a weighted average amongst all isotopes of that element. And so this is the reason why we're getting decimals after the whole number. And so these decimals, uh, it's not, um, it's, it's helping us um, understand that this is a weighted average. So the uh, atomic mass or the mass number is describing the weighted average of all of the isotopes for that specific element. Okay. Um, and so there's a specific formula to this and so I'm going to go ahead and just skip to the formula and then we're going to go ahead and do some practice problems. And so the um, average atomic mass, so the unit for the average atomic mass is going to be AMU. Okay, so that's going to be our unit for the average atomic mass. And so to calculate the AMU of any element, it's simply the weighted average of all of the isotopes. Now, the way that we're going to, we're going to calculate the weighted average is not like how we do it generally like in math, where we add up all the numbers and then we divide it by the number of trials or the number of, of sets uh, um, or the number of, of items within that set. And so when we're calculating the average atomic mass, we're, we're going to follow a specific pattern. So it's simply going to be the, um, percent, the relative abundance. Oops. Or, so the relative abundance, oops, don't, let's not do that. Uh, so the relative abundance, there's another name for it, it can be frac fractional abundance, um, you know, percent relative abundance, uh, the list kind of goes on. And so we're going to take the relative abundance and we're going to multiply it by the uh, mass of the isotope. Um, and then we're going to, if there's like more than, uh, well, for instance, when it, well, actually, let me see here. So when you use the word isotope, it implies that there's more than one type of isotope for that element. And so we always have to have like a minimum of two, right? And so this would represent isotope one. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what you label as isotope one, you just work with one isotope. And then we're going to repeat the same pattern for the second isotope. So I'm going to go ahead and take this and kind of duplicate it. Okay. And then I'm going to put a dot, dot, dot here. So this dot, dot, dot basically represents a repetition. Oh, actually, before I do that, so this is going to be isotope two. So this dot, dot, dot represents a repetition of this generic formula. And we need as many of these um, patterns uh, that's reflective of the number of isotopes for that specific element. So for example, if there's only two isotopes for that element, then we only need these two. If there are three isotopes for that element, then we need another set of this. 
So it's going to be plus whatever this is for isotope 3. Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and um, take a look at uh, an example here. So we're going to look at two isotopes for chlorine. And what we want to calculate is the average atomic mass of chlorine. And so here we, we can see that the uh, average atomic mass is approximately 35.4527. So we're going to learn how we're going to do, we're going to learn how to, how this number was derived. And so um, looking at this table, we have the relative isotope mass. So that's going to be the mass of the isotope. Okay, so this is the mass of uh, this isotope. This is the mass of this isotope. And so since the, the mass of this isotope, the first isotope is 34.969, we can go ahead and say that this is chlorine 35. We can shorthand it. And so since uh, the relative isotope isotopic mass is 36.966, I can go ahead and round that up to 37 to kind of like shorthand it. So this is basically isotope chlorine 35, isotope chlorine 37. Okay. But when you guys are plugging the, when you guys are, are using this in the formula, you need to keep the whole number. Okay. So in the next column is going to be the relative abundance. So the relative abundance is always going to be expressed as a percent. Now, when you guys are using these values in your formula, you need to convert percent into a decimal. And so basically you're gonna divide it by 100. So that's gonna be 0.7580. This is gonna be 0 0.2420. Um, and so now that we've kind of um, decomposed this table, we're going to go ahead and create our formula. And so we're going to go ahead and take the relative isotopic mass of chlorine 35. And so I'm going to put in 34.969 AMU. This is always in AMU units. Any um, mass uh, with respect to uh, the periodic table is going to be AMU. We're going to see that it changes when we're doing stoichiometry. It's going to be grams per mole, but for now we're just using AMU. And so um, 34.969 AMU times this by the relative abundance in decimal form. So it's going to be 0 0.7580. So notice all the numbers here refer to chlorine 35. And then we're going to go ahead and um, continue on by describing chlorine 37. So it's going to be 36.966 AMU times this by 0 0.2420. Okay. And so this is going to represent chlorine 37. Okay. Um, and so basically once you have all of that set up, um, we can go ahead and calculate the average AMU by plugging all of this into the calculator. So just give me a second here. Let me grab my calculator. And so if I take 34.969, multiply by 0 0.7580, that's gonna give me 26. Point uh, five zero, oops, five zero six. Um, and so when we're applying rules of sig figs, uh, notice how there's four uh, significant figures here. There's five significant figures here. So we just can we we're only going to report um, four sig figs in total. And so I'm going to go ahead and erase this, and then just round that up to one. And so this is going to be plus uh, the product of these two. So this is going to be um, 36.966 times this by 0 0.2420. And that's going to be 89. Oh, sorry. 
four, five, seven, seven, and then there's a whole bunch of numbers. So four sig figs, five sig figs. And so uh, since I'm using multi rules of multiplication, I'm gonna keep four sig figs. So the first four sig figs that I see is right here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and round this to six. So now that I have um, it simplified, I'm going to use rules of uh, addition for significant figures. So I have 26.51. Actually, let me just sh shorthand this. So here for rules of addition for sig figs, I have two decimal places. I have three decimal places. So overall, I need to report three, or sorry, I need to report two decimal places because that's the least. So I'm going to take that number and add it to 26.51, and um, I get an average AMU of 35.46. Uh, uh, okay, AMU. Sorry. So this unit is AMU, this unit is AMU, and the percentages are unitless. Okay, so there should be no unit in your decimals or your percent. And so my final unit is 35.46 AMU. So this is the average atomic mass for chlorine. So notice I've incorporated all isotopes of chlorine, and this is the average atomic mass that I get. And so let's go ahead and um, check my answer to see if I'm close to the periodic table. So notice that the average atomic mass that they calculated with a better precision is 35.4527. And so here I got 35.46, okay? And so um, uh, basically since I'm applying rules of sig figs in my calculation, uh, I'm not getting exactly uh, what I get in the um, periodic table of elements, and that's always going to be the case. Uh, but, I mean, this goes to show you, this demonstrates how we calculated the atomic mass or how the atomic mass was calculated uh, that's seen in the periodic table. So that's pretty cool. All right, so in this last example, um, we're going to go ahead and look at strontium. So it looks like strontium has four isotopes. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the average atomic mass for strontium. Since there's four isotopes, then we need to repeat you know, this pattern four times. And then each of these segments are just going to be added to each other. And so to get the average atomic mass unit for strontium, I'm going to go ahead and take uh, the atomic mass unit or the atomic mass for that specific isotope and multiply it by the decimal of the uh, fractional abundance. And so remember, we need to turn this percent to a decimal. So I need to move it two places to the left, divide everything by 100. So this is going to be 0 0.0056. This is going to be point, uh, 0.0986. This is simply going to be 0 0.0700. And then this is going to be 0.8258. Okay. So that's a common mistake that a lot of students make. They don't um, divide the percent by 100 uh, when they put it into the calculation. So just be aware of that. And so for strontium-84, um, SR-84, the first isotope, I'm going to take 83.913428. And then I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.0056. And so this represents strontium-84. Plus, um, I'm going to take 85.909273. Times this by 0 0.0986. So 
So this is going to represent strontium-86. Okay. Plus um, 86.908902 times this by 0 0.0700. And then that's going to represent strontium-87. And so I need one more, and I'm running out of room. So I'm just going to go ahead and put plus uh, strontium-88 here. So that's going to be parentheses 87.905625. Uh, times this by 0.8258. Okay. So this is going to represent the calculation for strontium-88. So I'm going to basically plug all of this in my calculator. Um, just give me a second. Uh, I encourage you guys to go ahead and do it on your own. Um, and so this just might take some time. So I have 83.913428 times this by 0 0.0056. Okay. And then with the correct number of sig figs, this just boils down to 0.47, okay? Um, yeah. And so I'm going to go ahead and do the next one. That's going to be 85.909273 times this by 0 0.0986. And then that's going to give me to the correct number of sig figs, which I need three sig figs. So this is two sig figs. This is three sig figs. This is three sig figs. And then this is four sig figs. Okay. So to the correct number of sig figs, I have 8.47. Okay. And so for this section over here, I have 86.908902 times this by 0 0.0700. And then that's going to give me uh, 6.08 to the correct number of six fi sig figs. And finally, I have 87.905625 times that by 0.8258. And then to the correct number of sig figs, I have 72.59. Okay, that's four sig figs. And so I'm simply going to add all of these numbers together. Notice I have two decimal place, two decimal place, two decimal place, two decimal place. So when I'm adding all of these numbers, um, I'm just going to go ahead and report two places after the decimal. It doesn't matter how many whole numbers I have uh, to the left of the decimal. It just matters how many um, places after the decimal I record. That's basically the rules of addition for sig figs. So it's going to be 72.59 plus 6.08 plus 8.47 plus 0.47. Okay. Um, and so it looks like my average atomic mass for strontium is going to be 87.61 AMU. So let's go ahead and compare um, the, the calculated value that we get to the value that's seen in the periodic table. So strontium is a period two element, and if you look, its atomic mass is 87.62. If I go back to my work, I get 87.61. So we're definitely in, in good approximation with um, the atomic mass that's observed in the periodic table. And so the moral to this story, besides you know knowing how to perform the calculation, is that the atomic masses that's observed in the periodic table is calculated from the uh, percent abundance of each isotope of that element. So every single element that you guys see here, um, it's highly likely that they have an isotope 
Um, so, you know, not all uh, yttriums will have an atomic mass of 88.90585. There's isotopes in which its atomic mass is slightly higher or slightly lower. It just depends on the number of neutrons. Um, but, you know, overall, we've been able to demonstrate how to calculate the atomic mass using this equation. Um, we know what isotopes are. Uh, it's the same number of protons, different number of elect, uh, same number of protons, different number of different number of neutrons. I apologize. All right. So when we get back to lecture on Wednesday, um, we're going to go ahead and start with the history of the atom, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you guys for um, watching this this lecture video. Hopefully, you guys learned something. Bye.